All right. Okay, I'm so lucky because I've got Donna Geffner right here, one of the creators of the auditory skills assessment. And the question I want to ask Donna is, number one, I love your ASA. I love how easy it is to assess the children. And I love the cut score. Like it perfectly divides kids that I'm concerned with and kids I'm not. I'm so glad to have that baseline information. It's also so nice to have testing that doesn't require a child to speak as much, you know, to have the picture pointing is wonderful. Lots of kids enjoy the test. So thank you first and foremost. The second thing I wanted to talk to you about is the wording. So at what point in your reports, at what age of the child will you actually write, I am diagnosing this child with APD? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And I think because the test goes down to three and a half, and it was at that point that we were able to get enough reliable data that we had an R score co coefficient that was sufficient. And then we knew we had a 60% reliability there, which was very, very plausible for, for Pearson to accept it. And by the way, this test took over four years to five years to produce. It cost the company several million dollars because we sent it out to um, evaluators all over the country, different levels and different populations and different socioeconomic backgrounds to be able to, to really norm it. And, um, and of course, I worked with the late, great Ron Goldman, who was another joy in our profession. And so Ron always felt we can do this. We, and, and he agreed with me, we can get there younger. So when a child is three and a half, and that's at that point where we knew we could get a good hit rate on those kids. So I would be comfortable saying the child's at risk because you got to give a little wiggle room here that there could be something developmental. But when I get a kid at four and a half and five who fails that test, I will say he's an auditory processing disorder because one of the things that we got in that test was the data of what children, normal children do. And if this child is not meeting the criterion reference for normal kids, not only is he at risk, but he's very likely to have an auditory processing disorder. And if we say the word disorder, a school district, a pediatrician, um, a psychologist will sit up and listen. If you say the kid's at risk, there's more of a chance that that school district will dismiss him and say he's too young. Bring him back when he's eight or seven or he's seventh, second grade. Well, we don't do that with language. We don't do that with articulation in our kids. So why should we do it with their auditory skills? We know early on these kids are making it or not making it. And that's one of the, what I think is one of the good points of the test is we've established what those criterion references are. And we can, we can measure them against normal hearing kids. And we were careful to select those kids in our, in our population uh, to get those kids that had no background of otitis media, that had normal speech and language development. So we were careful enough to select the norm population. That is so, brilliant. And I mean, when I see parents who have young children they're concerned about, they will often tell me that they first notice difficulties or differences in their child's processing around two years of age. So, I mean, how young were you testing down to? Like, what, what did you... Well, we went to three. I researched the literature, and it was only a couple of studies that were done in England that went that low. And I remember having a conversation with Frank Musiak when we talked about testing young kids, and he said, I said, well, Frank, I think it was you and uh, your colleague, Shermack, that came out and said, we have to wait till seven. And he said, well, the reason there was we didn't have instruments to test them younger than that. So it was at that point we had more data, but now that's no longer the case. It's no longer the case. And I think people are starting to come around to see their, what we can do. And we know that the auditory system is malleable. We know that there's neuroplasticity. We know that if we put an FM on these kids, we're going to change that brain, the auditory brain over time. Uh, we know that auditory training works. Uh, we know early reading training works. And, and I, I quote Nina Krauss in her work at the Brain Rainbow. She's seeing these kids uh, at one and a half and two. She's going to be able to identify those kids at risk for dyslexia because it shows kids who are dyslexic have difficulty with speech discrimination. And it shows up early on. And even she had a seminal study in, in the kindergartners and children who cannot take the dinner, remember those words, din of the classroom, are at risk for a reading disability. Well, those are the kids we sent. Those are the kids with 
reinforce speech discrimination. They can't listen to noise. And to test them and say the hearing's normal, the home uh, is missing a whole population of these kids. And, and I really think we make a difference. I see it in my practice every single day. And so do you, uh, Angela. So bravo to you on the other side of the world, because you're carrying the torch over there. And that's great. We're trying. And I, I've got to say that I use your tool, not just for three and a half to seven year olds, but if a child is nonverbal, I mean, like I have used your test on children that are much older that just cannot complete a standard battery, but I need to get baseline information. So I just want to thank you for that. Like, I absolutely adore you and what you have done to make this happen. Like, like, honestly, it, it you needed, it, it needed we needed to have something, something to use as a test 